Chapter XXBIII, The Place Royale. They proceeded silently to the center of the place, but as at this very moment the moon had just emerged from behind a cloud, they thought they might be observed if they remained on that spot, and therefore regained the shade of the lime trees. There were benches here and there, the four gentlemen stopped near them, at a sign from Athos. Portos and D'Artagnan sat down. The two others stood in front of them. After a few minutes of silent embarrassment, Athos spoke. Gentlemen, he said, our presence here is the best proof of former friendship. Therefore, to reproach himself, hear me, Count, replied D'Artagnan, instead of making compliments to each other, let us explain our conduct to each other. Like men of right and honest hearts, I wish for nothing more. Have you any cause of complaint against me or Monsieur d'Herblay? If so, speak out, answered Athos. I have, replied D'Artagnan. When I saw you at your chateau at Bragelon, I made certain proposals to you which you perfectly understood. Instead of answering me as a friend, you played with me as a child the friendship, therefore, that you boast of was not broken yesterday by the shock of swords, but by your dissimulation at your castle. D'Artagnan said Athos, reproachfully, you asked for candor and you have it. You ask what I have against you, I tell you, and I have the same sincerity to show you. If you wish, Monsieur d'Herblay, I acted in a similar way to you, and you also deceived me. Really, Monsieur, you say strange things, said Aramis. You came seeking me to make to me certain proposals. But did you make them? No. You sounded me. Nothing more. Very well, what did I say to you? That Mazarin was contemptible, and that I wouldn't serve Mazarin. But that is all. Did I tell you that I wouldn't serve any other? On the contrary, I gave you to understand. I think that I adhered to the princes. We even joked very pleasantly, if I remember rightly, on the very probable contingency of your being charged by the cardinal with my arrest. Were you a party man? There is no doubt of that. Well, why should not we, too, belong to a party you had your secret, and we had ours we did exchange them so much the better it proves that we know how to keep our secrets. I do not reproach you, monsieur, said d'Artagnan, tis only because monsieur de Lawfer has spoken of friendship, and what do you find in it that is worthy of blame, asked Aramis, haughtily. The blood mounted instantly to the temples of d'Artagnan, who arose, and replied, I consider it worthy conduct of a pupil of Jesuits. On seeing d'Artagnan rise, Portos rose also, these four men were therefore all standing at the same time, with a menacing aspect, opposite to each other. Upon hearing Zortagnan's reply, Aramis seemed about to draw his sword, when Athos prevented him. D'Artagnan, he said, you are here tonight, still infuriated by yesterday's adventure. I believe you are heart noble enough to enable a friendship of twenty years to overcome an affront of a quarter of an hour. Come, do you really think you have anything to say against me? Say it then, if I am in fault, I will avow the error. The grave and harmonious tones of that beloved voice seemed to have still its ancient influence, whilst that of Aramis, which had become harsh and tuneless in his moments of ill humor, irritated him. He answered, therefore, I think, Monsieur le Comte, that you had something to communicate to me at your chateau of Bragelin and that gentleman he pointed to Aramis had also something to tell me when I was in his convent. At that time, I was not concerned in the adventure, in the course of which you have so successfully estuped me. However, because I was prudent, you must not take me for a fool. If I had wished to widen the breach between those whom Monsieur d'Herblay chooses to receive with a rope ladder and those whom he receives with a wooden ladder, I could have spoken out, what are you meddling with? cried Aramis, pale with anger, suspecting that D'Artagnan had acted as a spy on him and had seen him with Madame de Longueville. 
I never meddle save with what concerns me, and I know how to make believe that I haven't seen what does not concern me, but I hate hypocrites. And among that number I place musketeers who are abs and abs who are musketeers and... He added, turning to Portos, here's a gentleman who's of the same opinion as myself. Portos, who had not spoken one word, answered merely by a word and a gesture. He said yes, and he put his hand on his sword. Aramis started back and drew his. D'Artagnan bent forward, ready either to attack or to stand on his defense. Athos at that moment extended his hand with the air of supreme command which characterized him alone, drew out his sword and the scabbard at the same time, broke the blade in the sheath on his knee, and threw the pieces to his right. Then turning to Aramis, Aramis, he said, break your sword. Aramis hesitated. It must be done. Said as is in a lower and more gentle voice. He added, I wish it. Then Aramis, paler than before, but subdued by these words, snapped the serpent blade between his hands, and then folding his arms, stood trembling with rage. These proceedings made D'Artagnan and Porthos draw back. D'Artagnan did not draw his sword. Portos put his back into the sheath. 